right, welcome to Gimme Three. This is Technology Business Research's Gimme Three series where I get to ask three questions of my colleagues, three things, three questions about things that they've been researching that they've been working on. So I'm joined by John and James today and we're gonna talk about the federal IT space. So that is the IT services companies that focus primarily on serving the US federal government. And they put out a benchmark every quarter. So we're gonna talk about using that as a baseline, but we're gonna talk about what's gonna be happening coming forward in 2024. So let me start with a real basic question. What are some of the things that you two saw in 2023 that you think are gonna be the most important trends that are gonna carry over into this year, 2024? John, we'll start with you. Yeah, I, I don't think that you can, and you may not need to go any further than just the strength of the overall market. We've never seen a market this robust um, I personally have been tracking the federal IT space since 2008, and I can't ever remember there being a market um, as, as strong, the volume of IT spending, and it's across the board. I mean, it's going to vary agency by agency, but the overall volume of spending, the overall commitment to, to IT modernization has never been stronger. I think the, the big question is, is 2024 going to be as robust as 23? And at least given the early indications from the vendor set that we follow, it, it does appear as though it's going to be another very good year. Whether we will have another record quarter, you, you mentioned the benchmark that James and I went to market with a few weeks back. That was the strongest overall quarter that we've ever wow. seen. Whether we duplicate that, I don't know, but the indications are certainly there that we could at least see one more likely more quarters that will be as uh, fairly, almost as strong. So. Well, that's a great setup to the second question, but James, I want to know if you have anything else to add on that sort of trends question. Yeah, so I, I, I probably have like a fairly long-winded answer on that's that great. one. That's great, let's hear it, so let's go. Trust me, there is a point <laughs> while I ramble on this. So last fall, Mantech acquired Definitive Logic, and that, that was really interesting, for me at least. So since being acquired by the Carlisle Group for $4.2 billion in, I think it was September of 2022, Mantec's been quietly restructuring. We've gotten some glimpses under the hood, some like leadership changes like Matt Tate being appointed president and CEO, some like notable contract wins have been announced like supporting Titus, but we've really had limited glimpses on what's going on at Mantec. Right. And then suddenly they acquired this 330 person company for an undisclosed amount. And we, we know that their like overall goals have been bringing digital to the mission, focusing on their five core technology focus areas. And this acquisition certainly supports that, uh, you know, giving them AI capabilities, cyber, other digital transformation capabilities. But the really interesting part, and like I said, I promise there was a point with this was <laughs> it expedites the development of their own digital transformation consulting practice. And this comes on the heels of, I think in May, GDIT announced that they had formed their own digital consulting practice. Now Mantec's been pretty quiet about like what they will be doing with their practice, but we know with GDIT, they were quick to say that it wouldn't be siloed off. It would be structured throughout the organization. It would have a say over where they would be investing and directing resources in. And, you know, they, they also did other aspects of it. So rather than being used to immediately expand its addressable client base, it's an opportunity to support their existing clients. That, that's right. how they were approaching it in their own words. It, it'll be interesting to see what Mantech does with its own digital transformation consulting mm -hmm. practice. But what, what I think will be really interesting to like follow this year, and it's just whether more of our benchmark vendors get in on that seat, form their own digital consulting oh. practices, hop in on that front, and make it a more competitive scene. Yeah. Like that, that's what I think will be pretty interesting going forward. That's a perfect marker to lay down because it'll be clear whether or not other companies follow that strategy because it's not something they're gonna do and stay quiet about. I mean, if they mm -hmm. if they wanna make that move, they're gonna certainly gonna announce it. So I'll start with you, James, and then, and then come back on that. Um, other than Mantech, or maybe there isn't, is there a, a vendor you think is gonna be worth keeping an eye on? Because they're going to be particularly active and, uh, and attention worthy in 2024. I, th that's a pretty good question. There's definitely a lot of storylines, at least I'll be tracking this year. Like, will ICF's digital modernization business be able to keep rapidly expanding without 
engaging in any M&A activity, mm-hmm. will the 5G Edge Accelerator, Accelerator Coalition you know, make any meaningful announcements this year? Will GDIT do anything with its digital consulting practice? I mean, kind of they already have. They've expanded their digital accelerator practice from like six focuses to nine now, mm. most recently adding in systems engineering. But it, it, I'm, I'm like getting distracted because like... <laughs> There's so much going on. I, yeah, no, yeah, just, yeah, yeah, fair well, enough. Uh, my like main focus, I would say like, I think Paradin will be the one everyone talks about this right. upcoming year. And so to backtrack like a little bit, in 2021, Paradin's this company doing a little over a billion dollars in annual sales. Suddenly, they're doing over $7 billion in annual sales after right. this rapid-fire mega-merger between Prospecta, Northrop Grumman's IT services operations, Violence Cloud operations, just takes them to this next level. And right. They had hundreds of thousands of items to address on their integration process, master schedule. They had things like reducing their workplace footprint from 150 facilities down to less than 100 divesting uh, on, on essential business line, uh, mm. workforce rationalizations. And it was doing all this while contending with inflation and supply chain disruptions. Right. And yet, despite all that, massively successful, it, it regularly competing with tier one vendors like Lidos for enterprise IT awards in the $500 million to $2 billion award range right. in federal health right. and civilian spaces, while also securing DOD and IC awards that you know, there's a high barrier of entry on. Right, and right. They've only been getting better the longer they've had these assets. And so I, I anticipate they'll surpass over $8 billion in annual revenue during 2024. What I think people are going to be talking about this year, though, is whether they go public, whether right. Veritas cashes out. Right. And so the leadership teams at Veritas and at Paradin are going to want to make sure they can consistently meet revenue, profit streams, they're going to want to make sure that they're positioned well on the emerging technologies front because they've been, you know, for like two years, they have this massive mega merger going on. It's hard to focus their resources. They're going to want to make sure they're well positioned on that and have like firm alliances with existing partners like UiPath. Right. And it, right. they'll be focusing on that. And so v- Veritas has been a very like flexible owner. But private equity always cashes out. Yeah, it, that's the point of private equity. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it'll, huh. I, I think it's going to be sooner rather than later. I, I would anticipate the IPO in 2025, but yeah. we'll be hearing a lot about that process in 2024. Getting ready for it, yeah, yeah. Excellent. I know there's a special report on that that um, we should talk about, too, or we have talked about. Yeah. Um, John, who, who stands out for you this year as somebody to keep an eye on? If I, I'm going to have to pick two, yeah. um, and for but for a couple of the same reasons, those the two vendors being Lidos and SAIC. Mm. The reasons being, they've each named a new CEO over the last. Um, well, Lidos was back in uh, May of last year. Tom Bell took over. Okay. He he came over from Rolls Royce's North American group. He had been running their defense business mm. for several years. So he he comes on. Comes on board at Lidos with a lot of experience working with the defense community, a lot of experience working in a more product centric, solution centric yeah. role, which which does fit with the way that I see Lidos pivoting right now. Hmm. Um, with SAIC, um, you know, we we knew that Nazik Keen was probably after for roughly four years at the helm. We knew that she had been uh, planning her her retirement. Or at least we suspected it, and, and sure enough, back in uh, it was sometime over the summer, I think, that she announced that she was stepping down, and they brought in um, Tony Towns Whitley from Microsoft's Federal Group. She mm-hmm. also had experience with CGI Federal, so she's an, another very seasoned executive in the federal space. And not surprisingly, you, you name a new leader, and what's one of the first things that they do? They start to restructure. Re- reorg, right? Reorg, yeah. 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 Lidos yeah. is restructuring their. I, if memory serves me correctly, they're going to be reorganizing into five business lines. SAIC just announced that they would also be restructuring. Two of their senior leaders um, have decided to depart. So it's not surprising on behalf of SAIC. From my perspective, not surprising to see them do that. You know, re- cloud is really going to be the tip of the spear for SAIC. Yeah. It was a little more surprising to see Lidos do that because they've established themselves as the largest 
federal IT competitor from a revenue standpoint, they're going to hit fifteen billion. I'm guessing when their four four Q earnings comes out yeah. comes out in yeah. late next early to mid uh, February mm-hmm. next month. It was a little surprising for me to to see that since they are the biggest company, their strategy has 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 been working clearly. They've made effective acquisitions, but then Tom Bell steps in and talks about strategic sharpening. Yeah. It yeah. it makes sense that. You know, and, and maybe they've just got a better crystal ball than everyone else. And they're looking at the next 10 years of the market. And they're saying, well, now is the time to start making changes. Now is the time to accelerate our pivot from, you know, being just, being more enterprise IT services focused to being more product and platform focused mm-hmm. to making, um, establishing new revenue and profit streams from the DOD, from a platform, from a solution standpoint. So I'm going to be keeping a very close eye on each of, of those competitors to see how the reorg is going, how well is it working, how well is it being received yeah. within each organization, yeah. and that is it gaining traction in the marketplace. I mean, at the end of the day, yeah. you know, show me the money. Yeah, you know, if, yeah. if the uh, it's either working or it isn't, and one way we're going to know that is doing yeah. exactly what TBR does, which yeah. is you know uh, taking the, uh, the the fiscal data and relating it to strategy. Right, right. Strategy, performance, what's yep. what's been the outcome. So you mentioned a crystal ball and, and you both mentioned acquisitions and, you, and we're talking about strategy here. So the last question is, um, if you've had, to, you mentioned been doing this since 2008. So if you had to think about the trends that you've seen and maybe even some of the strategies that you've seen develop over the last 10 years, let's go, let's only go back five years. So mm-hmm. like early pandemic through pandemic and now where we are now. What is going to be, what is going to, what's going to shape the market? And I'm curious, especially when we think about a company like Periton that kind of came out of nowhere and went from a billion to 7 billion or going to be 8 billion and did it in a different way through the private equity, through mm-hmm. some, some, you know, sort of cobbling together acquisitions. So what, what is going to be those trends that we see that, that have been developing, not just in the last year into this year, but the five year, the long trends that are going to hold on? Well, I'm glad you mentioned the pandemic because that was an inflection point in the market. Yeah. Um, prior to that, you you could talk to every federal CIO and every agency, and they would tell you the same thing. Yeah, we, we could see that the future of the market is cloud. Mm-hmm. You know, we are going to have to migrate our our workloads and our infrastructure over to cloud infrastructures. You know, we we accept the business case, um, but they weren't really doing it at speed. Right. Okay. So then the pandemic happened. The pandemic exposed the weaknesses across the the federal supply chain, across federal IT infrastructures, and accelerated the, the push to cloud. Now, you know, the executive leadership in the White House is 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 putting more and more pressure on agencies mm-hmm. to get more efficient, to modernize their systems, and we've seen this explosion in in federal IT spending since then. I think if you go back to the fiscal federal fiscal twenty twenty budget. It was roughly ninety-two to ninety-four billion, and it could surpass one hundred thirty billion this cool. year. Yeah. So yeah. that's yeah, that's, that's a lot more that's IT bad. spending, right? And all of that growth, just about all of the growth, is is being driven by modernization. Yeah. So if there was a silver lining associated with the pandemic, it was that federal agencies are finally across the board, civil, intel, defense. Yeah. They're 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 getting, and I think it was led by the defense sector because they needed to stay ahead of their. You know the the uh, nation states rivals China yep, and Russia yep, primarily, yep. but um, agencies are finally getting up to speed. They're finally recognizing, uh, or I shouldn't say they're fi- they're finally taking action. They have recognized the need right. for modernization. Right. Now they're making it happen. Right. You're you're going to see a continued acceleration in cloud. You're going to te- you're going to see a continued acceleration in just you know updating and modernizing the baseline infrastructure because you can't layer. You know, AI or, you know, large language models or any of the emerging digital technologies right. on systems that, you know, in some cases are using 40 year old right. programming languages. Right. It just isn't going to work. Right. So that has been ex- certainly accelerated. You know, the, the modern, the overall modernization trend has certainly been accelerated yeah. by the pandemic. I don't see, I mean, um, unless there's some major macroeconomic disruption that in turn disrupts the federal budget process just from a, um, a dollar inflow mm-hmm. standpoint. I don't see that changing. I see yeah. that being sustained. You know, there may be, once again, some agency, some variants you know, on an agency by agency basis. But, you know, and, and what we're keeping an eye on now is, you know, what's the impact of Gen AI going to be? But right. those technologies, 
they're, I think they're, 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 they're waiting, the federal IT decision makers are waiting for the proofing of the business case in the commercial mm -hmm. sector, but also the concerns around governance have to be addressed. The concerns around the impact of the federal workforce, yeah, yeah. because you've got a workforce represented by a union or a series of unions yeah. that are very powerful, yeah. maybe the most powerful in the world. Yeah. And if there is a major disruption, you know, caused by Gen AI, they're going to have something to say about right. it. Right, right, so. right, right. And it's fascinating how much that spending is increased. I didn't realize that. That, that if that can <coughs> sort of, and had just a quick question on that: How much of that increase in the spending, in the, in the IT spending, went to the companies that you two cover? I mean, the majority of it, or half of it, or even just a third of it? Um, I, I'm guessing since we're tracking. A revenue base around between thirty-five and forty billion. The, the I would have to you know, take a look to, at our models to see what the, the the latest data is, but it's between 30, 35 and forty billion, and that roughly represents about a third right. to a tw you know twenty-five percent to 33 percent of the overall federal IT market. But I think you could you could safely say that that a larger proportion of the increase went to went the, to the went to the tier ones. Right. Right, and that's because they're the ones that are able to deliver at scale. They're, they're the scale, right? Exactly. Right. It almost always comes back to that. All right. Um, so I know that was three questions, I, but I do have to have one more. You guys knew it was yep. coming anyway. Uh, I can't resist. So I want to talk about something you don't know. You've been doing this for a few years, James. You've been doing this for fifteen years, John. So mm -hmm. are there? Is there a question about these vendors that you cover? So we mentioned Periton, SAIC, North of Grumman. We mentioned uh, Lidos, Central Federal <clears throat> Services, that whole bucket of, of characters. Is there a question about them that you just don't know? And if, if you had to say, if I could just sort of, you know, if I could ask Magic Gen AI, like the, the, the amazing Gen AI, the answer to this question, and I'll, I'll give you, I'll give you while you're thinking about that, I'll give you an example. I look a lot at the management consultancies. Mm -hmm. One of the questions I always ask myself is, what is it going to be that finally disrupts their business model? The consulting, the management consulting business model is hire smart people and throw them at a problem. That has not changed in decades. And I always wonder, what is it going to be that's going <clears> to <throat> finally change that business model? So it doesn't have to be that. I'm not asking necessarily about the business model, but is there sort of that one question that you think, when you look at that cast of characters, that you cover those vendors mm -hmm. is that is there something that's been bugging you for 15 years or something that's been bugging you for three years james well i'm going to put you on the spot and make you go first what's a question that you haven't been able to get an answer to well paired in ipo is probably the first one that comes to mind <laughs> right. but um, mm -hmm. i don't know um i guess since i've taken coverage uh oh no <laughs> i had a better one we were just talking about this who bought Raytheon cybersecurity <laughs> business? That would be, be another great one. <laughs> that is a good but, one. Uh, yeah, yeah. It was over a billion dollars October, I think. And there's just been no word on who purchased it. And it's it's rather it's a rather interesting move, you know, divesting yeah. that business and then it's gone, it's just, gone from coverage. There's right. nothing to talk about now right. about it. That's kind of crazy. That hasn't happened. I mean, John, in your experience, that hasn't happened that many times where an acquisition of that size has sort of happened and then it's been a bit of a mystery. I can't think of one top of mind, yeah. but this this was a, this, for, at least from our perspective, was a fairly high profile yeah. uh, decision for Raytheon to make because it essentially represented the complete exit of the company from anything related to enterprise IT and IT so services. Good. And yeah. uh, and yeah. we, we had always, at least yeah. I, in my 15 years, I'd always considered and heard others affirm yeah. this that Raytheon was a leader. You know, if you were in the cybersecurity and the logo on your, your your company's building was not Raytheon, they were your likely your biggest competitor right. in cyber. Right. Okay? And they had right. the scale, they had the technology, they had the right. expertise. And now they're so where did it go? Right. Where, 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 where did, did where did one of the leading <laughs> cybersecurity businesses in the world go? That's crazy. Who bought it? How much crazy. did they pay for yeah. it? Yeah. So that's 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 a yeah. that's a great question. So John, it's something that's bugged you for 15 years about these guys? Uh, maybe not for 15 years because we, we've we've had, you know, the, the pendulum always seems to swing back and forth. Um, well, I suppose then you could you could say, well, what's bugging me is what's going to happen when the pendulum starts to swing the other way. Yeah. Because yeah. eventually the party will be over, or at least the party is going to wind down a bit. Right. Right. You know, the we, we may not see the same level of growth in federal IT spending 
we may see a return to a more uh, sequestered environment. Um, we may see a, a return to what they used to refer to as LPTA, the acronym meaning lowest price, but still technically uh, acceptable right, right. contracting. Basically, right. so in that environment, you know, how does re really the only way that a contractor can differentiate is on price. Price. And, and availability. It, Being and able to have the people to throw at the problem. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But it, it really waters down the the value of the technology and the solution when you're just competing on price. Yep. And it really disincents. So my question would be to the vendors, well, what are you doing now to prepare for that? Okay. Are you yeah. are you just are you just trying to gain as much wallet share as possible? Which looks like that's they a strategy. Are. That's a strategy. Not a problem. And yeah. and that would that makes perfect sense given what we've observed, the how aggressively especially the tier one contractors are in going after the strategic awards, the multi-billion dollar, multi-year, you know, multi-source awards. Mm -hmm. So what are you going to do to differentiate yourself when, when you can't do it just based on, you know, word of mouth, just based on past performance, right. just based on, you know, the, the number of really smart people that you can right. throw at a problem. It's fascinating. We're seeing a very similar <coughs> challenge happening in the uh, IT services in the commercial side where a lot of the India centrics are just throwing bodies at trying to win the biggest mega mm -hmm. multi-year deals they can just as a way to lock in that revenue mm -hmm. um, yep. as they anticipate that sort of um, that yep. downturn in the spend. So, yes. gentlemen, thank you very much. That was a really Great. good give me three. Um, no doubt we're going to come back in a few months. We're going to talk about Ariton. We're going to talk about what happened to Raytheon's cybersecurity business and who knows whatever else so thank you guys right, thank you thank you